Group. So we're going over chapter 20 today. Um, I think, so I've actually looked at the rest of the book um, and we have like chapter 20, 21, 22. Uh, 20 <clears throat> is looking to be like kind of big, but that's like the most fundamental chapter. So I think if I don't get to everything today, we can just do it over like two parts. Um, chapter 21 is very like laundry listy of like new themes, new stats, new geoms, um, which like they don't go into that in that much detail. So that could just be another day. And then the case study stuff, it is very big. Um, and if we really want to get serious about it, it might take like multiple days. But I think like we don't really need to cover <laughs> chapter 22 if, um, you know, people want to like take some time to digest content in 20 and 21 because we're like shifting gears a lot um, starting from just chapter. Uh, but yeah, so chapter 20 is on uh, ggpod internals um, and basically this chapter introduces the idea that like everything that we've been talking about so far in the user facing code like geom underscore stat underscore um, all that stuff is actually very different from what ggplot actually does under the hood to like make graphical elements and arrange different pieces of the plot together. Um, and so this chapter goes over um, the difference between user facing code and internal code um, and specifically inside the internals, there's this step that we call the build step that's handled by the function slash method ggplot build. And then there's the drawing step that's uh, handled by ggplot gtable. Um, so that's the other thing that we want to be um, wary of when we're learning about internals. Um, and there's, of course, we've been talking about grid a lot. Um, and ggplot is uh, basically supplies like data frames that are ready to be turned into grid like graphical objects. Uh, and so like this chapter also introduces some ideas about like where does the job of ggplot to end and where does grid take over. Um, and once you try to like, once you start like compartmentalizing these different steps in the internals, then you'll realize that a lot of what happens inside ggplot is basically data wrangling, which was, you know, again, kind of the motivation for ggtrace. Um, yeah, and then it very briefly talks about ggproto, but I think uh, we'll probably not get to that today. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to start off talking about is just like motivating this idea that like internals exist and there's more to just the code that we type in. So um, we can see this in like multiple cases. I pulled out just two cases where uh, what we see from the code that we type and what actually happens under the hood are very different. So um, the first case of this kind of incongruity between user-facing code and ggplot internals is in the order in which you supply some layers. And so we consider like scale x whatever, scale y whatever, as like a layer that we can add on with like the plus operator um, anywhere during the step of a ggplot um, you know, construction, like the user-facing code. So here we have a code that plots um, the empty cars data set. Um, it's just a scatter plot with like a um, LM smooth. Um, and we can place the scale function, like scale x log 10, before we plot the geoms. We could also place it in the middle of the two geoms, but the end result is the same. So it's not like, you know, depending on where you put the scale, it comes in and acts, you know, before a specific layer. It actually applies to the whole plot, right? So if we thought about layer, the order of some layers mattering, like scale, then we would have expected this part, this code, where the scale intervenes between geom point and geom smooth to produce an effect where geom point is drawn with the default continuous scale, and then the scales are transformed, and then you draw geom smooth in a log space. But that's not what happens. Scales are applied to the whole plot. And so this user-facing code that we type in and that, that sets some order between layers, uh, like scale first or scale in the middle, doesn't seem to affect how the internals are calculated. Um, the internals automatically applies to scale first, and that's like a template that exists, um, and you're trying to fill in the slots of the template. But the running order is always held constant. So that's one way in which the user-facing code and internals are different, and that's why internals should be studied or like should be understood as like a whole separate process. Yeah, right. 
So um, do you think that it's important for a, a user or a coder, I should say, to know which commands sort of go and like apply to the whole plot and which ones are more of that layer kind, like the geom point is a layer, the geom smooth is a layer, but the scale mm -hmm. X is goes to the, like, as you said, to the whole plot. Like, is it, do you think it's important to know which ones do uh, behave which way? Yeah, good point. Um, so I think that's kind of built into the design of the, the grammar graphics that it's okay for the user not to know because the grammar will never allow uh -huh. weird circumstances where a scale only applies to like one of the layers, one of the geoms. Um, so actually, um, Lee Wilkinson um, did an interview before he passed with um, John Schwabisch um, talking about how when he was at Tableau, uh, Tableau had this problem where this exact problem where if you introduced a scale transformation between like a scatter plot and like an LM line, then it would only apply to the smoothing line. Um, and that's not what the grammar should allow. And so he was talking about how as like a developer, you have to put in those constraints, but the user should ideally not have to think so much about that. Um, and if there are cases where, you know, for example, the user, if they erroneously think that a scale applies like when it was specified, and so like different geoms can be drawn in different, like, you know, log space, identity space, like exponential space, um, then if, you, if the user supplies a code that specifies multiple scales, then you should at least output a warning or fail graciously um, but then still let them know that this is not how it should work, which is what ggplot does. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it's fine for the user not to know, and ggplot developers are aware of that and kind of builds the system around users not needing to know that. But it is good to know that yeah. you know what we we call everything that we add with the plus sign layer, just like very like colloquially. Um, but the only real layers like in the very specific sense are geoms and stats that actually draw things. Um, but scale transformations, coordinate transformations, faceting um, are kind of applied at the level of the plot. Um, and so are not necessarily layers themselves. Uh, that, that's, yeah, great. that's a good question. So like, that's great info. So geom underscore star and then stat underscore are, are layers in the more literal sense and maybe everything else or generally everything else is kind of a, a to the plot level. Yeah. Right. So we will we will see this in the ggplot code. Uh, what actually gets run, like the common common function that underlies geom underscore and stat underscore are this function called layer, which returns a, a oh. layer object. And we'll we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But yeah, that's why that's why like stats and geoms are kind of two sides of the same coin. They just return layer objects but specify different parts as defaults. Cool. Uh, Yes, so that is one way, I think. Yeah, so so order of scales matter, but of course, as you said, order of like actual layer layers, like very specific layer objects matter. So like geoms and stats, their order in which they're specified or like order in which they're um, supplied in the user facing code matters for drawing. And so this one draws the points first and the LM line, this one draws the, the smooth and then the points. And then you can tell with like, you know, the points drawn on top of like the ribbons make it such that their lightness or brightness is the same. Whereas here, you know, the ribbons are drawn on top of the points. And so that matters for drawing. So there are certain certain circumstances where the user facing code does not match what ggplot does internally. Um, the second case of this, which I think is more interesting and kind of subtler is the fact that like, you know, things like geom smooth stat or um, even like facet and scale, they're all functions. So they're all things that are called with like the parentheses with arguments inside it. And they actually get evaluated um, as the plus sign like keeps, you know, going through the layers and adding them to the ggplot. Um, and so we can actually just like call geom smooth like by itself as if it were a function, save it to a variable. And then that variable is now of an object that is class layer. So these are the the specific like layer things that are getting added to the ggplot. A layer contains, you know, a geom, a stat, and a position. Um, we don't have to go through that all in detail, but this is just how layer objects got printed. Um, it's kind of nice to know um, so that you can just tell from the output of, you know, variables that it's like a layer object. Um, so we have this 
variable that is this call to geom smooth that specifies the smoothing method as like a linear model and then the formula as y predicted by x. Uh, so very straightforward. Um, when we add this single object to different ggplots, it's doing the same thing in the sense that it's drawing a linear model with you know ribbons and it's doing y as predicted by x, um, but it materializes in different ways. And so if you do LM smooth um, with the empty cars data set plotting mpg at the x and horsepower as the y, then you'll get like a negative slope, um, a negative correlation, negative relationship between the two variables. But then if you swap the variables to, I don't actually know what these are, but these are some car related terms. If you swap the variables to different variables, then you know, it's it's doing the same thing in the sense of drawing a, a you know fitting a linear model and plotting it, but then it materializes in a different way. And so this materializing part is what's handled by the internals of the ggplot, but the specification that you draw a linear model is handled by the user side. So the user provides directions for what should be drawn, but then the internals handle the actual process of drawing things according to the specifications by the user. And that's why we can like write ggplot um, in a very abstracted way of like draw this, draw that, but then not have to worry about the very low level details of how that gets done. So that's the motivation for why internals exist as a system and why we might want to know about it. Because if you want to write extensions, um, we want to do this, you know, internal like low level part so that our users of our extension packages can still do things like geom underscore stat underscore, but then we've handled all this low level parts um, internally. Okay, so um, continuing with that discussion is this idea uh, that, you know, this distinction between what gets done by the user supplying code and what gets done internally is separated by um, the plot method or the print method, which is just to say that um, there's a difference between defining a ggplot and printing or rendering a ggplot. So this is like, a, it's very hard to explain this concept, but here's just one way of approaching this. Um, here is a plot from the book that, you know, it's just another like scatter plot plus like a linear model that's like, uh, you know, that's faceted by another variable. Um, when we define a ggplot and save it to a variable, it is, um, comes with a class of gg and ggplot and it is essentially a list under the hood. Um, and we'll get to the list aspect of this in a second. Um, but what's, what's important about this step is defining it is not the same as drawing it. So this part of running this user code and saving it to a variable, that's the defining step. The rendering step is when you just call this variable or let it be evaluated by the console. So if you do type P and then run it in the console, that implicitly calls print method or plot method. Um, and that's when it gives you this plot, the thing that actually gets drawn. So this does not exist until you evaluate the ggplot object. But the ggplot object is constructed at the moment the, the user supplied code is evaluated. Um, so to demonstrate that these are two separate processes, uh, we can separate the, the saving, the, the evaluating the user code part and the plotting part. Um, we don't often think of this as two different processes because we would just type this in the console and like print it. And that does both the job of making a ggplot according to user specified code and also printing it. But then by saving it to a variable, we can separate the printing part from the defining part. So uh, step one, uh, we, we benchmark the process of defining it we benchmark the process of plotting it. And then you'll notice that it gives us different results. So we basically split up the process of the whole ggplot pipeline into two parts. The first part is defining part here. And the second part is rendering part. And as you might expect, you know, it takes very little, you know, if you look at the median time taken, it takes very little to evaluate user specified code and like, kind of take all these different kinds of commands from the user and then compile it into one single instruction for a plot. That step is very high level stuff and doesn't take a lot of time, but actually drawing the individual graphical elements of the plot um, as a result of you know, evaluating that instruction 
takes a pretty long time. So it's a difference between 17 milliseconds and a whole second. Um, yeah. And so um, the other interesting part here is uh, things like plot methods and print methods draw this ggplot, but do it as a side effect. Um, so a lot of print methods actually follow this pattern of um, doing some calculation, uh, sending it as like text to the console um, or like sending a message, but then invisibly returning the input so that you can like keep piping it or just like print should only be called for side effects. Um, and this is the same case of a ggplot. So um, the plot method for ggplot um, can be called like plot.ggplot and it lives inside the ggplot2 package and you have to grab it with the triple columns. Um, and the method is basically this function where X is your ggplot. So this function, this plotting function um, takes your ggplot, um, opens or clears out the display port. So like your display, like your RStudio plot pane. Um, and then runs this function called ggplot build on your ggplot object, and then runs this function called ggplot g table on the output of ggplot build, and then draws the output of ggplot g table onto the um, viewer and to the um, viewport. And then, so this is that step. And then there's this interesting step where um, like it checks whether uh, rail R package is installed. And then if it is, then it calls a function that um, kind of adds basically like L text style description to the plot. And then like attaches that metadata to the plot before returning it. Um, this is actually, did I put in a, throw in a reference to this? Uh, this is actually very interesting, like hush hush, um, like trivia Easter egg. Um, they used to just like ggplot used to just import the Braille R package, but Braille R got taken off of CRAN. But a way to like circumvent CRAN checks for imports is to call this function as namespace over the character Braille R instead of like saying library Braille R or like import from Braille R and then subset the Braille R namespace, basically the Braille R package space, um, and grab the function that adds the you know Braille metadata to the plot, and then call it on the plot. Um, so this way, it's okay for you to call function, or it's not okay, I guess, but you can call functions outside of um, things that you import or suggest or depend on. Um, in kind of like a gracious way because you have all these checks. So it does work, um, but CRAN will not check for it. So that's like a neat trivia. They have like a whole issue on it where they go back and forth between like, should we add this at all or should we do this? But this is a neat way of solving that problem. Okay, so then you go through all this step, but the idea is you do like all of this as like a side effect because at the end of the day, what this plot method returns it's just the input, but invisibly. Um, so what gets drawn, it's very, it's kind of hard to like grab what gets drawn because it's like a side effect. But again, that's also kind of the motivation for ggtrace. But you evaluate the plot, it takes one second, like we saw up here, it takes one second to take the plot, ggplot object, and then do all of this in order to actually draw the plot or I think in this case, it's like gives you a text output that describes the plot instead of drawing the plot. But in any case, it takes you a second to render the plot and then it returns you back the plot. So the rendering has plot rendering step happens inside the plot method, um, which is called when a ggplot object is evaluated, but not when it is defined, which is how we can separate these two processes. Um, and then that was kind of very complicated, but um, the plot method can be simplified to this function, which only has like four steps really. Um, it has a step of, again, calling ggplot build on the ggplot object, and then taking this and then calling ggplot g table function to ggplot build output, and then creating a new page for you to draw, and then actually drawing the output of ggplot g table, and then invisibly returning the input. And that gets you the exact same thing. It, it gives you a plot, which is what you expect. So 
Um, for those of us who are familiar with you know, the rest of the tidyverse, we can actually take this and turn it into pipes, which might be a little bit easier for you to digest if you're you know, accustomed to that. So this step of you know, like applying, applying functions, taking that, and then applying a different function to that, taking the output of that, applying a different function, can actually just be a chain of pipes. And so we can say, uh, uh, you know, the drawing of a ggplot happens in these steps where first of all, you clear the display uh, for you to draw in. So like you clear out the canvas, make it blank. And then you take the ggplot object, you pass it through ggplot build function, which prepares, uh, uh, prepares data frames that are ready to be turned into graphical elements. And then the output of that into ggplot g table, which takes those data frames and then actually makes them into graphical elements. And then take the output of the graphical elements and then pass it to grid.draw, which draws the graphical elements to the canvas. And then you get the same thing. Um, and at each step of ggplot build, ggplot g table, um, and even grid.draw, you get um, you get more the the like ggplot objects gets enriched with more specifications, um, more like low level descriptions of the plot. So the user facing code that was literally just like five lines of geom underscore and facet and whatnot, that was a very, very high level description. And if we look at the size of the, the user facing code when it when the instructions got compiled into a single instruction, um, that's 31 kilobytes. Um, if you apply the ggplot build function to our ggplot object that you know starts prepping the data to be turned into graphical elements. So now it's enriched with even more low level description. So the size is a little bit bigger. At the ggplot g table step, that's when you start creating graphical elements. So like, you know, like, like rectangles and points um, and like lines. So that's even lower level description and has a lot of low level information about what gets drawn. So now the size like jumps up a lot. So this ggplot g table step trace an object that's two megabytes. And then um, the last step of grid.draw is actually just like saving uh, the, the output of G table, like graphical elements, and then printing it somewhere. So we can mimic that process with GG save, uh, which like prints the graphical elements and then draws them into like a PNG file. Um, and when we do that, it also gets a different file size. And you'll notice it's like a bit smaller, but then once you get to this rendering step, the size of the object depends on, you know, like whether it's a PNG or a JPEG, um, its dimensions, like, you know, height and width um, and the resolution like in pixels or DPI, um, all of that contributes to the file size. But in this case, I just made a small file because um, I don't want it to take forever to knit the chapter. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of the idea behind ggplot internals as having many different steps and how ggplot internals, the code that gets run internally is happening when you evaluate a ggplot and render it, uh, which formally put um, happens when you call, when the print or plot method of the ggplot object um, is called. Yeah, so that's the plot method. Thoughts so far? Yes, mind is blown. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That, it's really cool. So one of the things that I was thinking while you were describing this was mm -hmm. maybe it would be a good exercise or somebody that wanted to understand ggplot better, especially, you know, what you're actually coding to understand it better would be to take what would be to first um, make like a simple bar graph or something using empty cars, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and then do the same thing with all of these these intermediary steps that you're describing so right. like do um like do it in uh, gg ggplot build and then see the output of ggplot build and then looking at that see the output of ggplot g table mm -hmm. see the output of that and then i mean i guess grid dot draw would just be to, to draw it but uh, right. it seems like it might be um informative to create a, a graph first a plot first and then redo it using these steps and see what the the step-by-step -step output would be yeah that is a great point um and i guess i could 
just demo it really quickly. I will say it will be not super interpretable because like the build step and gtable step are themselves kind of beasts. So they do a lot of things all at once. But if I am to just do this, I think I need to share a different screen, my R screen. There we go. Um, so our plot P is here. I think that's just going to draw our plot if we evaluate it like this. Um, but this is, you know, 31 kilobyte. This is how we know that P as a ggplot object only contains like instructions for drawing. So, and, okay, so and, this is like small. Mm -hmm. and, and P was the, the typical code that you would that you would write as you're creating one of these, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, except we don't think about ggplot objects as instructions. We think about them as plots, as figures, right, but it right. takes a lot of stuff in between. Yeah. Um, so ggplot object, like, and by ggplot object, I mean literally like class of an object has, you know, class ggplot. So this is how you know something is a ggplot object. Mm -hmm. ggplot objects are not figures, they're instructions. So all of all of the user facing code when, you know, when ggplot this function, right? These are all functions. When functions are evaluated and evaluated according to like the plus sign, like evaluate ggplot and then plus whatever, like everything, all of this code ends up evaluating to, um, you know, just instructions for the plot. And then the drawing actually happens when you evaluate it. So we have P here. If we do, whoops, um, ggplot build on our plot, then it returns us like a lot of different information. Um, ggplot build also has this side effect of drawing a plot, which makes things very confusing. But what you'll notice is the output of ggplot build is actually just a list of elements, um, which are which should be very mysterious to you, but but you'll notice um, that it's a. I'll actually just give you names of the list. It has a, it's a list of three um, elements: data, layout, and plot. Um, and we'll go over like what this actually means. But plot is just the input. So like the plot is this is the same as p. Um, and this is why it draws like the plot as a side effect because you kind of hold it while you're doing ggplot build. Um, the layout part is just information about things like how many like facets do I have, which are not part of like the layer specific data, but more about layout of the whole plot. Uh, so like scales and faceting and coordinate transformations are in here. And then data is the layer. So like geoms and stats, it's the data in this context is um, literal data frames that are prepared for each layer, um, which then gets sent off to ggplot gtable, where gtable will take instructions for each layer and then draw according to the data provided by each layer. So I think P had like um, G on point as layer one. So this is the data for G on point. And then this is the data for G on smooth. And you'll notice that they look different because Geom Smooth has to calculate things like y min, y max to draw the ribbons. Um, so you end up with this drawing ready data, which then gets sent off to the G table step. G table is like, okay, so I know what data I need to draw. Let me go back and look at what I'm actually drawing for each layer. Oh, the first layer is Geom point. So I take all of this information and draw points out of it. Oh, and you know, second layer was Geom Smooth. So I take all of this information and draw, you know, lines with ribbons um, with this information. And then, you know, if you pass the output of this to ggplot gtable, um, again, looks kind of mysterious. And um, I think it ends up drawing to the plot pane as well. Uh, but it's just a table of graphical elements that are organized um, by, you know, by the description. So like axes and facet strips and axis labels and you know, panels, panels are like the, the part, the important part where like things actually get drawn like geoms and stats, geoms and stats. But yeah, this is, this is like just a, an, uh, uh, all the graphical elements that go into the plot organized in like a table format um, because that's kind of nice for, to work with for ggplot at least. 
And then this is basically, you know, the information you need to draw um, the actual figure. So you call grid.draw and then gives you a figure. It's kind of lagging, but anyway, you get the point. Yeah. So yeah. So what there is a lot going on, which is why I think rest of this chapter will break down what happens in these two steps. So okay. <laughs> then maybe I maybe we can. My, my next question was going to be about G table, but it sounds like you might be getting to it, which is the difference between what you see in the data, like the output from ggplot build mm -hmm. and the output in ggplot table is like super condensed. Like I can't see anywhere from G, G, from G table where you have things like color or values or whatever, like is, so is that captured somewhere? Is yeah, so related to that number at the very end, dot five four four four. Yeah, so yeah. this is this is just a unique identifier for each object. So G table just really quickly, um, like is an actual table with rows and columns. The rows or the columns, sorry, contain information like Z, which is um, like the order in which they're drawn. Um, so this is. C as in like third dimension, right? You stack objects on top of each other. Um, the cell is actually, let me, uh, let me show you the reason why it's called G table. It's because it arranges the plot in a table layout. So um, there's this function inside G table that's called G table show layout which will give you the layout of what graphical elements occupy what cells in this you know, table layout. And that information is stored in here, the cells, right? So like our first panel occupies cell from cell 88, which is like somewhere around here to 55, which is somewhere around here. And so you get this big cell. Um, and then panel, the second panel occupies this big cell. Um, and this is like the like top left corner and bottom right corner, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, so this is like a very high level description of what goes in each cell. But then this grob column actually contains, is like you say, very condensed object that contains everything that gets drawn. Um, and so, uh, you know, this one is like the entire plot background is just like a single rectangle grob, but you can have more complicated grobs like G trees. Um, G tree is uh, basically like a tree, hierarchical tree representation of grobs. And so like you have children of a grob and that grob can be a child of another grob. And so, you know, this condenses a lot of information. Yeah, as you say, um, and you can inspect it um, just to show you that like things are all the information from ggplot build is still here, but in like graphical form. Can do... This will show you all the elements that are in this plot. And you'll see that, you know, looking at the indentations, this is what tells you like the hierarchical nature um, of each plot um, that's kind of condensed into the table representation. And this is all of this is created by the G table step, which is why, you know, it's a lot of things condensed up. But yeah. So cool. Unreal. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of stuff. Okay. I'll clear this out. Um, and I'll go back uh, because we will see like build step and G table step in detail. Um, I think G table tends to be a lot more mysterious because it involves like grid objects, like actual like polygons and triangles and points and whatnot, but at least the build step is very familiar, like dplyr style style data wrangling. Um, so I think I have just the build step prepared here because the chapter is kind of big, but hopefully I can at least get through the build step. So um, as we saw, ggplot build is essentially, oh, I hit the history, but ggplot build is essentially a function that gets called on our plot. Again, we can do something like p pipe ggplot build as if it were to call any other function on any other input. Um, ggplot build is um, actually, again, like a method. Um, so you'll, you'll see that, you know, ggplot build is 
a function, but it's a specific kind of function that is also called a method. Uh, what it means is just like, you know, like plot and print. It just means that specific classes have different ways of um, different methods for this function. So it depends on like, like drawing, calling print on a ggplot and calling print on like a character vector obviously goes through different processes. That's because print is defined for ggplot objects. Print is defined for character vectors. Same thing here, ggplot build is defined for a ggplot object. And you might be wondering like, why, why else would you need a ggplot build method? Like what else would ggplot build function be defined for? Um, I actually don't have a good answer to that, but I think that's just how ggplot works. Um, they like to do things in terms of methods. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's a method. So that means we have to, to inspect it, we have to do something like this uh, because again, ggplot build is uninformative, doesn't really tell you what you're doing when you're calling it for a ggplot. But then if you say, give me the ggplot build method as defined for the object of class ggplot, then it will give you the function uh, that is actually ran. So, so it's, it's kind of a lot, but you will notice this repeating pattern of, I'll actually show it from here. You'll notice this repeating pattern of doing something to the data and then assigning it back into the variable data, do something, assign it back to the variable data. And you're constantly updating this variable called data, which then ends up being returned. And that is the data element of the list that was the output of ggplot build that we saw earlier, which contains all the transformed data that's ready to be plotted for each layer. So the data corresponds to things that are drawn because again, layer objects are really things that um, have to do with what gets drawn, not things like facets and scales. So this is um, actually just a very straightforward data transformation pipeline, and we can even inspect it as such. Um, so I think, yeah, so this demonstrates the same point. Um, inside ggplot build, it's just this uh, drawing ready data uh, stored inside the variable data that's built up incrementally by continuously assigning back to data after doing something with data. Um, so data, you know, arrow, data, arrow, data, assign, data, assign is a lot of what this entails. And there's like 33 different steps um, in this function. Uh, so the first part of ggplot build is what's called data preparation. Um, and this is actually, or I'll, I'll just go through this. So uh, basically we know that each layer needs some kind of data to work with to draw things. Uh, we might not always be thinking about this because um, like in our p plot example, we didn't like specify for each layer what the data should be. We just said like ggplot empty cars at the top and then had like geom underscore functions, um, which means that each layer just inherits from the top level ggplot function call. Uh, but you can also in, uh, specify the data in many different ways. So in this plot, we again have ggplot function at the top that creates a, instantiates a ggplot object um, with the data empty cars and these specifications for the aesthetics. Um, if we do something like geom point and maybe like some, you know, hard coded um, aesthetic like color should always be blue, um, that comes with an implicit data equals whatever was up here. So inherit the data. It implicitly, if you don't specify the data argument inside geom or stat layers, then it will just grab it from the top level ggplot. Um, and then, but then you can also supply the data directly. So in this case, we also have another geom point, but then the data is the output of this. And this evaluates to another data frame. And so you can supply another data frame that is not empty cars to the data argument of a layer. You can also um, supply a function that will apply to the inherited data. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with like this dot pipe notation or like dot anything notation. Um, in McGritter context, if you do something like this, it returns you a, a function. So I think I can say something like, so I, I stored, you know, it just has a starts with a dot and then continues piping. Um, this variable f that I saved, whatever the output of this to, is a, a function. 
type closure of function. Um, and so you can create a, a unary function. So one argument of function with this shorthand, which I actually find very nice because it makes it sound like, you know, empty cards is getting piped into it, which is exactly what's happening anyway. But yeah, so we have instead provided a function here instead of a whole data frame. And that's another way of um, supplying a data to a layer. So uh, this plot um, has three layers that each has shows showcases three different ways of supplying the data to the layer. Uh, and if we plot it, it looks like this, which is not super interesting. Uh, but what is interesting is um, each what the data that each layer starts with. Um, so, oh, this just shows you that, um, or actually, I'll actually return to this later. Um, but yeah, this is showing you what each, the, the data that each layer starts with. So for our first layer, you can ignore the syntax for now, but here's the code if you wanna reproduce it. The data for our first layer is basically just empty cars. That's, that's the input to the data transformation pipeline that's gonna happen inside ggplot build. For data, for, for layer one, it's just empty cars. For layer two, it's empty cars, but I think we did some like, group by and summarize with it, or maybe we did like a filter with this one. Um, so that's why it looks slightly different and it's also a, a tibble instead of just a base R data frame. Um, and then layer three, yeah, layer three is the one where we um, pass, pass the layer of function that groups by and summarizes um, the inherited data. So this is empty cars with group by and summarize. So each layer starts with their own data um, as the input. And then ggplot build actually doesn't know about the relationship between layers. So it, it's almost like a vectorized operation over layers. So each layer gets their own special treatment according to whatever instructions for the layer there is. Um, so ask, yeah. A quick question. Um, yes. I think I might've lost a, a concept. When we're talking about layers, we're really just talking about iterations of the data Right, or these aren't these aren't like plot layers, right? Mm, so a a layer is like basically everything, both the data and the the instructions. So uh, a layer, like we said, has like a geom stat and a position. So mm -hmm. when you print out layers, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. um, and and this information is stored in like the, you know, as I said, ggplot is basically a list. There's a layers element to the ggplot list, which gives you all the different layers. These are layers and each layer has a corresponding data. Um, so given a data, when the layer steps in, then it will start like, you know, transforming a data and whatnot. Um, I think and it's, yeah. If you scroll down, there was a, mm -hmm. where we looked at the raw data, which was layer, like layer one. Yes. And then it got transformed a little bit to layer two and then transformed further to layer three. Oh, but, but not each one of those layers corresponds to a layer in the plot. Oh, oh sorry. This is not like a trip, uh, pipeline. So this is just, these are independent data frames. So uh -huh. what I meant to say is um, the data that's associated with this first geom point layer is just the inherited data. Uh -huh. And so it looks like this, which is empty cars. Uh -huh. The data for the second layer is this new data frame that takes the MPG data set and then I guess mutates a column. And so that's why the layer for data two looks like this. And then the layer for data three is empty cars, but then grouped by fill and then summarized for this, I okay. guess. And then it looks like that. So all of these three data frames are corresponding to each layer. And this is just the data that each layer starts with in the data transformation journey. Got it. And then from yeah. there, it goes into build and, and table and G table. Yeah. So this is, this actually happens as the, one of the first steps in build. So um, everything that has to do with data transformation, like data frame transformation happens inside of ggplot build. And mm -hmm. the first step inside ggplot build is to just extract the data that's associated with each layer to okay. begin with. Okay. So that is going to be the first time these two lines are what does that. And that's the first time that we create this data variable inside um, our ggplot build function. 
Um, and data is always going to be a list of data frames because you know it's a data for each layer and we have multiple layers. Okay. And in this case, data only has it's you say it's a list, it's a list with three elements, three data frames. Yes. Okay. Three elements, um, which is gonna be corresponding to the three layers data of layers. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, if we did data like bracket bracket one, that's gonna be empty cars, which is inherited. Data bracket bracket two is going to be you know, MPG, like a different data frame that we provide, mm -hmm. data bracket three will be, you know, empty okay. cars passed through the group by summarize function. Yeah. Cool, I'm yeah. with you. Yeah, great. So that happens um, step five through step eight is um, when ggplot build grabs the data that's associated with each layer and then saves it to this variable called data. And then this data is gonna get continually updated um, until we reach the final point when we have a drawing ready data frame. Um, the next time that a data is transformed is I think, oh, this is just to demonstrate that after step eight, when this happens, um, the data variable looks like this. So it is a list of, you know, first element looks like this, second element looks like this, the third element looks like this, uh, again, each corresponding to the, the three layers. Um, right. And then um, after we grab the data, we start transforming it according to each layer's different specifications. Uh, so by step 11 in the ggplot build pipeline is um, the step where you set up the data frame with information about panels. So panel is always going to be going to appear in the data frame specification because we're going to use that later to, you know, uh, to do like split apply combine step of like grabbing the data that's associated with each panel and then doing computations within each panel, uh, which is relevant for some, some geoms. But you'll always have that panel column um, inside ggplot build. So that's one of the first things that's going to get added. Um, after this step happens in step 11, you inspect the data with this code, uh, which basically looks at what this data variable looks like um, at step 12. So after step 11, um, and you'll see this panel variable added. Um, I think at this point I switched over to the P plot because that's kind of easier to deal with. So this is again, the first layer is a geom point and the second layer is geom smooth. And in our P plot, um, they both inherited the, the empty cars data. So they look exactly the same up to this point. So the data that they start with is the same. And then the data after um, the panel information is added is the same. And here panel is just uh, a numbers, number IDs that are associated with the facets. So, so these rows in the data frame are gonna be used to plot things in the first panel. And then these rows in the second panel and stuff like that. Like nothing has happened in terms of splitting them up yet. We just added the information that's necessary for us to do the splitting at a later point. And then in the step right after the panel is added, that's when the group column is added. This is also the same as the group aesthetic, if you want to set that manually, um, which I'm not sure in this case if we did, but sometimes group is um, set manually by the user. Sometimes it's inferred from interaction of discrete aesthetics like color and fill. Um, but whatever the case is, once the groupings are computed, they again um, are added as columns um, where the value of the group column refers to which like group a data point belongs in. And again, so panel and group are two columns that will always exist because they're necessary to do computations. Um, depending on how you facet and how you group um, the data. And at this point, it's still exactly the same because I think both of them, um, you know, a, a facet applies to the whole plot. So of course the panel information is gonna be the same. And then I think they both has that same group aesthetic. So, you know, the, the scatter, the, the points are gonna correspond to the lines for the scatter plot and linear model relationship. Um, at step 13 is when the scale steps in and so the scale um, in this case is going to transform the X and Y if it's, I think currently it's just a scale continuous, which does like an identity transformation, like leaves it alone. 
Um, so the X and Ys are still the same. But then for um, when we add things like scale X log 10, then this is the step where you're going to transform um, your X or Y um, aesthetics. And so the X values are look very different now. And you can also see that it applies to all the layers in our data because scales apply to the whole plot. Um, and you also notice that this happens very early. Scale transformations happen very early. And that's why scale transformations, um, it's important to know when scale steps in because that, has, that can have consequences for later steps like statistical transformations, like box plots. Um, and out of bounds handling also appears here. So that's when uh, values are turned into NAs if they fall outside of a certain range. Um, so this is also why it's important to know when scale steps in, because if you're doing another like box plot, then these data will be removed before you start calculating something like a box plot. And so we've so far gone through the step of grabbing the data, adding the panel column, which gives you information about uh, facets, adding the group column, which gives you information about the groups, and then doing scale transformations. And then the next step is the stat transformation, uh, which we've talked about a lot. But basically, this is the point at which um, each layer stat steps in. So for our first layer, for G on point, it's stat identity, which you know might be expected because you just expect points up here at the intersection of X and Y. Um, for then for G on smooth, the stat is stat smooth. And so because at this point, different layers have different stats, the data is transformed in different ways. So now the data starts looking different. Um, the data is unchanged for our G on point data but the data has now been changed with additional columns like Y min and Y max for the stat. And then, um, so that's the stat. And then after the stat happens, the position steps in. Uh, this part isn't super complicated, but um, it happens at, after the stat, a stat at step 22. Um, and it matters for, um, I guess, if you wanna do like a jitter. So our original plot had a, position jitter for G on point. And so the X's and Y's are jittered a little bit. And this happens after the stat. And then I think finally, the geom steps in and then adds some aesthetics that are relevant for the things that are drawn, so for the actual graphical elements that are drawn. Um, so so uh, defaults for things like line type weight and alpha, um, which are necessary for the plotting of things like smooth lines. Um, so they show up here. Um, and then for points, you need things like stroke for the width of the outline. Yep, I think that's about as far as I can get. So I'll stop here um, and we will reconvene.